So our next guest, Ryan Johnson, is a data privacy attorney. He sits on the boards of a couple companies and provides general counsel regarding data privacy. What's unique about him is he worked for almost a decade in IT before becoming an attorney. This interview is a little less technical than some of our other ones, as he gives insight into how companies are navigating the increasingly complex state, local, and federal data privacy laws, breach disclosure laws, as well as some of the new affirmative defense and safe harbor laws. We hope you enjoy. Hey, Ryan. So thanks for joining the podcast. Um, as a way of getting started, tell us a little about yourself. Looks like you went from originally working as an IT administrator and uh, privacy law. Yeah, well, it's a, a funny story, a lo- you know, somewhat long, but the shorter version of it is, is I, I worked in uh, IT for years and years. I, I started in uh, telecom, um, you know, way back in the day, you know, rolling out high speed internet when it first kind of jumped off and eventually kind of morphed into the telecommunication side of it. And, and then when voice over IP became a lot prominent, I kind of switched over to, 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 to the network side of it. And, you know, and it all kind of has an interplay together. I, I worked as a system administrator and just overall IT person uh, for, 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 for a few years, for, for many years, actually. Um, but one thing about IT that I noticed uh, when I was working in it primarily on the technical side was that it changes so incredibly fast. And, and I, I always wanted, you know, even as a little kid to be, you know, an expert at something or, you know, well-versed in something or a subject matter expert or something, but you could never really catch up to the curve when it comes to IT. Like as soon as you master something, um, the technology would completely change. And so um, that coupled with, you know, I always had a desire to go to law school. I, I ended up going back to school. And and once I, I got out of school and got started practicing law, um, I didn't want to just start from from scratch because at this point I'm like a 37, 38 year old, you know, fresh, you know, lawyer. Um, and so I wanted to use my background in a way that could give me somewhat of an advantage where I could, um, uh, you know, be somewhat of a, you know, have somewhat of a, you know, a expertise or something. And so I, I found this lane when it came to IT law when I first started and I was doing anything that had to do with IT. I, I mean, if it was like a SAS agreement or any type of technical agreements and things like that, I was working on, I was working on internet def- defamation. And, and, and then GDPR came down the funnel and there was this mad dash here in the United States for organizations to, to come into compliance with GDPR. And I was, uh, I was teaching at Grand Canyon University and, and they tapped, I was teaching law uh, business law, and they tapped me to design a course on data privacy law uh, for the cybersecurity program, and and I did, and I really, really just loved it. I mean, I I, I took to it to like a to, to like a fish to, to water, so to speak, um, having to understand you know the history of of, of European uh, rights when it comes to uh, you know data and personal personal information and privacy. And so that was that was the catalyst of it. it. You know, it kind of just took off from there, and I started to 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 focus on getting certified and studying and studying and studying more in the field. And and then I found my lane. I found my niche. It was, it was data privacy. And so, um, as you guys know, it's you know pretty 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 hot right now. But you know, there's this overlap between security and privacy, and so that's kind of you know where I found the sweet spot is is, is right in between with with privacy. And now security. Um, so for, for the folks who are you know primarily involved in security, I, you know, I absolutely love what you guys do. I am enthralled by the uh, intelligence and the and the, and the, and the proactiveness that there is, is required. And so, you know, I'm kind of straddling that line right now. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, even even since GDPR, it seems like privacy laws have uh, proliferated quite a bit. I know we'll get into some of the different uh, navigating some of the different state privacy laws as well as disclosure laws. But could you give us a little bit, I guess, like a high level overview of some of the some of the cases you've worked on, and kind of so, some of the conclusions that you've that come from, I guess, some of the settlements and litigation. Yeah, so you know, it's ironic that there is, you know, the, the, well, it's not necessarily ironic, but the litigation that kind of ensues from from data breach, data breaches, and, and security incidents. I personally am not involved in that in, in, in the day to day litigation of data privacy. I'm, I'm more of a compliance uh, side of it, the proactive uh, side of it, so to speak. Where we try to you know prevent that from happening uh, for our clients. Um, per, you know, as it, as it is now, I work as an in house counsel for an ed tech company. Um, but, you know, 
it's so funny you mentioned that. Like, I recently just gotten um, a settlement check from the Equifax uh, breach uh, that happened back in 20, I think it was 2017. I, I forget what it was, but I got like $27. Um, and so, you, you know, when it comes to litigation and when it comes to these class action lawsuits that result from the litigation from a data, you know, data breach, um, the only folks who really generally benefit are are the class action attorneys, and not to say that they shouldn't. I mean, they are you know doing the work to get to get it across the finish line. But um, I, I guess you know more importantly, the de- it serves more as a deterrent, I guess, for organizations to make sure that their um, their security and privacy practices are are, are in place. Um, but but yeah, it's it's been a challenge. Um, I, I have worked with outside counsel in the past uh, in various roles that I've been involved in when we've suffered uh, a data breach or any type of incident. And, and what we'll talk about in a, in a second probably is, is breach is a defined is a legally defined term. And so you'll you'll start to discover that a lot of folks are hesitant to use the word breach, especially attorneys. And so we'll kind of revert back to a security incident or a data incident as opposed to a full blown breach that triggers a uh, a host of uh, legal, you know, legal requirements and regulation. Uh, but when it when it comes down to the aftermath of an incident or of a breach, um, it, it's a slow moving process. It takes years and years and years for these cases to get settled. It's usually the the insurance companies that are paying out, um, and that's as a result. That's why we see cybersecurity policies that have skyrocketed uh, over the past few years, and it's really becoming an issue. And the cost of doing business in the digital world is becoming um, increasingly large. Yeah, so you touched on a little bit, kind of working some companies' executives as well, as sitting on boards of a few companies. How do you think most executives are viewing cybersecurity, and how do the constant? It seems like almost every day there's a new breach or new privacy controversy coming out. How do you think that's shaping the way they think about security and privacy? And how do you think that they should be thinking about it if they're not thinking about it in the right way? Yeah, great question. You know, I, and I will say this: it, it is a hot ticket item uh, in the boardrooms and in and in, in the C suites uh, because they are starting to get the bills from um, either from a full blown incident, uh, if if that was unfortunately the case, or from just cybersecurity coverage. And they're in order to do business now with other vendors, or if you are, you know, especially when it comes to B two B, you have to have these things in place. You have to have a security and privacy compliant. A program in place. You have to have cyber assurance, cyber cyber coverage, um, and executives are starting to see the bills. Basically, um, not to say that that is the only driver for you know their attention, uh, but it as you mentioned, it's in the news. I mean, it, it's it's on the forefront of just about everyone's minds when you hear about the incident or a breach, um, almost you know on a daily basis. Um, I, I, I know that in my experience, either presenting to boards or sitting on boards, um, it is definitely a interesting topic that board members and executives are interested in. Um, I have seen uh, folks that uh, are on the board that are very well versed. Uh, they, they do their homework. They are asking the correct questions. They're asking if we have the correct measures in place, the correct um, uh, uh, compliance or frameworks in place. And so I've, I've been very impressed with um, the, the executive uh, interests, uh, but not only that, the executive buy-in and the board member buy-in when it comes to uh, funding security and privacy programs. It's one thing for our organization to say, hey, you know, we are complying when it comes to privacy and security measures, but there's another thing when it comes to putting the checkbook behind those, uh, those promises. And we're starting to see that more. We're starting to see budgets that are um, that are increasing, that are um, that are carved out for security uh, prevention. Um, because as a, as opposed to the past, and as you guys know, you know sometimes you know IT in general is seen as a, you know a, a cost center, or at least it has been in the past, where it's not really a revenue generating uh, vertical or or department. Uh, and the same with security, uh, same with privacy. To be honest with you, a lot of folks have seen it as cost centers. Like, hey, you know, I'm not going to dump a bunch of money into this because it doesn't bring us a return. But I think that the data is starting to come in that, um, that you know, I don't know, what that, I forget that saying, an ounce of preparation is, is worth a, a pound of, uh, of uh, consequences in the end, uh, where folks are starting to dedicate those resources to adequately equipping these programs. 
so they don't have to deal with it on the back end. So I, I've, you know, been very impressed. I know, at, you know, in my career working as IT, I've always had to scratch and fight for funds and budgets because, you know, folks didn't want to give it to us because, you know, again, you know, we didn't generate any revenue. Um, but, but I think they're starting to understand that a lot more now. And to add to that point, um, you know, I think we talked about this offline when we had an opportunity to first meet, but um, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, has you know recently adopted a rule that requires uh, Fortune 500 or publicly, I'm sorry, publicly traded companies, uh, their boards must have someone with a cybersecurity background uh, on the board. Um, now, obviously, there probably aren't enough cybersecurity, high, you know, high-level cybersecurity professionals, or you know, going around to sit on every single board. But what you're seeing is board members are being trained and being certified on um, on, on security and privacy practices, and and they're able to meet meet that obligation of the SEC. So, folks are, t- are definitely taking it seriously um, be, because it's money at the bottom line. You know, at the end of the day, it, it, it boils down to to money and 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 having a return for your shareholders um, if you're a publicly traded company. That's a really interesting point. So do you, do you feel that boards are more uh, proactive or rather reactive uh, to security incidents and breaches when they occur? It sounds like they're starting to spend more money on security and IT, uh, but at the same time, they're starting to spend more money after the fact, after an incident, after something goes wrong, after you know something uh, changes within the environment. Uh, so just curious to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, great point, man. And it, it varies. Like it, you know, you know, obviously you're, and this is what I always have explained to executives and, and senior level um, uh, folks in organizations that you're going to pay one way or another. Either you can pay now or you can pay more later. And sometimes folks understand that and sometimes they have to understand or fully understand and comprehend the consequences for them to understand that. Um, but we are starting to see uh, uh, executives and boards to be a lot more proactive when it comes to uh, allocating the resources uh, for at least just compliance. And, and in order to, to comply with the Penelope of, of regulation that is you know floating around, whether it be international or domestic or, or state or at the state level, um, they are requiring robust cybersecurity, security and privacy programs. Uh, and in order to be able to do that, to be into compliance, obviously you need those resources. So um, we are seeing a, a bit more of, of, of proactiveness on the behalf of management and uh, executives and, and, and uh, corporate boards. And not, and I want to say because they have to. I mean, they, they, it's because they have to. Uh, you know, it's just a cost of doing business now, to be quite honest with you. It's almost like carrying, you know, business insurance or liability insurance or malpractice insurance. Um, it, it's just literally a cost of doing business right now. And that's getting rolled into the cost of products. Uh, you know, we talk about, you know, inflation has been, you know, really, you know, high up in the news for the past year or so. Uh, but what folks don't understand, there's a, a whole host of issues that goes into that inflation and, and, and security and privacy is one of the things that is driving costs up because it's becoming um, more costlier for businesses to do business uh, with regards to a, a, a robust program or, or cyber, cyber coverage and, and things like that. That's interesting. I never really thought about the inflation aspect to it, but it does make sense. One thing you mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, you touched on briefly implementing some of the security frameworks, which is generally something we advocate for as well as implement for companies, as well as I know there's been a few states that have passed affirmative defense laws like our uh, neighbors north in Utah, as well as a few others where basically they'll shield you from some of the liability if you've implemented a security standard such as, uh, or I should say security framework such as NIST or ISO. What's your take on those and how do, how do boards generally see those as well as the frameworks? You know, you know, I mentioned earlier that the executives and board members are becoming, you know, a lot well versed on the topic. And so in the past, they would have relied primarily on the expertise from uh, from from either the CISO or the CPO or, or, or something, something along that nature. Um, but what I'm seeing is that board members are have done their homework. Um, you know, you can Google security, you know, you just do a search for security and privacy programs. And that's one of the things that, that come right up are some of the uh, um, more robust privacy or security frameworks that are out there, whether it be NIST or ISO. Um, and not only that, 
a lot of organizations are requiring it. So when we see, uh, so if, if two organizations are doing business with, with each other, not only would you have a, an agreement or a contract, you know, for the, for the goods or the services that they're offering, but also when there's the digital component to it, you also have a data privacy agreement or a data sharing agreement that, that goes along with that. And in those agreements are requirements that um, not only privacy requirements, but security requirements as well. That says, hey, you must, you know, implement, you know, a, a, a something that is equivalent to in this framework or or ISO framework or, or something to that effect. And and executives are seeing that um, they are understanding that, and and so they are proponents of it as well. And yeah, again, for an organization to be in compliance, you know. There's only so many things that you can do, and, and having an overarching uh, security and privacy framework is one of them, um, and that helps cover the uh, the wide variety of, of cybersecurity requirements and cybersecurity and data privacy requirements that we're seeing from state to state, whether it be Utah or Colorado or California or Virginia or Illinois, um, you know, you name it. Um, most of the statutes will call call out specific frameworks that they are looking for or the equivalent thereof. And so um, it's becoming a lot more common, um, which is a good thing. Um, you know, that commonality that we're having and that synchronicity that we're having uh, between organizations when it comes to security measures, um, it's becoming a lot more streamlined. And, and that is super, super, super helpful. And uh, to your point about our neighbors to the north in, in Utah with the, um, the, uh, the unique position that they took with the cybersecurity affirmative defense uh, provisions in their laws that basically says that, hey, if you have a security incident, um, you know, it is an affirmative defense or what that basically means is that, you know, you're kind of, you know, off the hook basically if you have certain things in place and, and one of those things that they require is a, a robust uh, privacy or security uh, framework in place and if you can demonstrate that to the regulators when when and if they come knocking or to um, or, or if you are subject to litigation um, then that absolves you of any subsequent responsibility there interestingly enough um, i think that model will probably You'll, you'll probably see that adopted at the federal level. Um, there has been a lot of talk on whether or not we will get some sort of omnibus federal uh, privacy regime similar to GDPR or similar to PIPEDA or something like that we see in Canada or something in Brazil. And I do think it is coming. Um, and one of the sticking points has been with um, getting that bipartisan uh, buy-in has been the private right of action, which means that if there is a, a breach, uh, individual um, users would have a, a cause of action against the company. And that's where you see those class action lawsuits, you know, start to um, to pile up. Uh, I do think that at the federal level, there will be some sort of, uh, some, some sort of uh, affirmative defense carve out for organizations who have implemented a robust security program. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens. I, I think that now it's just so incredibly difficult to do business with the patchwork of, of privacy and security requirements across the nation that um, it, it, I mean, even the large tech companies are begging for it. They're saying, please pass something so we can have uh, some sort of uh, synchronicity and compliance, you know, with, with, with our compliance across the country and across, and across the globe. Yeah, that's an interesting point because I've looked at some of the state privacy laws as well as state breach disclosure laws. It seems like some of them in some ways have contradicting terms between one state to another, as well as like if you're a large company or even a company that does business across multiple state lines, it becomes extremely complex and confusing to, to operate between those. How are companies currently navigating all those different state laws? It, it is an absolute mess. I mean, a mess. I, I mean, I can't tell you how incredibly difficult it makes um, our job. But it's job security for one thing, um, you know, for, for folks who are in that industry when it comes to data breach responses, the incident response and forensic investigation. Um, but if you can just imagine a giant spreadsheet with every single data breach, every single state and all 50 states plus, plus you know, two or three um, territories in the United States have the data, some, some form of data breach notification regulation in place. 
And so if you can imagine a, a spreadsheet that's, that's just filled with requirements, um, individual requirements, and you have to piece through them and say, okay, we had, you know, 2,300 users in Utah, or, you know, d- d- depending on the scope of the, the, the incident, of course, or we have 14 users in Hawaii, you know, what are our obligations here? Some states may require you to notify the state's attorney general. Some states will give you um, um, uh, affirmative defense, whether you, you know, you have, you know, some, yeah, some, some incidents or I'm sorry, some, some programs in place, whether or not that, you know, dictates whether you need to inform um, a data subject or not, you know, just to be determined, but it can be an incredibly complex process that you have to go through state by state, line by line uh, in order to do that. One thing that is that is fortunate, I, I guess, for organizations is that um, a lot of times when you have cyber coverage, your cyber insurance policy will assign you or give you uh, a vendor, a data breach coach, so to speak, that will come in almost like like a cleaner, almost like a you know that person who comes in and cleans up the mess. Uh, they will do all of that for you, uh, and generally your insurance policy will cover that. Uh, but it's the lawyers that are doing most of this work, um, and they're charging a lot. Um, and that's why the uh, cyber coverage costs a lot, and that's why businesses are passing those costs on down to um, on down to their individual customers as well. So that's an interesting point. Can you speak a little bit on the trend of companies investing heavily into the cybersecurity policies, and then sort of where they start neglecting the security measures because uh, they're investing so heavily into those policies? Yeah, good point. I mean. You know, we talked about some of the agreements that need to be in place for 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 business to business relationships. Um, and so, if we are contracting with a vendor, we may say, "Hey, we need for you to have at least five million dollars of, uh, of of breach coverage." And so, that's the driver for organizations to have. That's the main driver, I should say, for organizations to have cyber coverage because they can't do business with other businesses unless that unless that is in place. So that is helpful for the insurance companies, of course. But the insurance companies have had to pay out so incredibly much, you know, and whether it be for for ransomware or whether it be or ransom demands or whether it will be for um, um, breach notification or class action lawsuits or, you know, operating a call center. I mean, there's a host of, uh, you know, uh, re- requirements that, that, that come into play. But. Um, a lot of times these, these companies, they have to have it. They just have to have insurance and it's just a cost to do a business. Um, there are some companies who take the um, position to self-insure. Uh, so if I have just $5 million in, in, in coverage, um, I may, if I'm an organization and I don't want to pay, you know, that $400,000 a year premium for, 500, uh, for $5 million worth of coverage, I may just take five million dollars of my uh, resources and dump it into an escrow account, and I can I can show uh, either vendors or folks that I do business with that hey, we're self insured, we have the money, it's there, uh, it's um, you know it's in a lockbox, we won't touch it in case there is an incident. And I suspect you may see that trend growing a little bit more as the uh, cyber rates start to increase uh, exponentially. They have slowed down in a bit. We were seeing probably. Um, you know, 50 to 75 percent increases year over year. And, and they are starting to uh, taper off, I think, um, where we're, we're still seeing about 10 to 20 to 30 percent increases year over year. But they're not doubling like they like they like they were in the past. Um, in addition, some of the cyber carriers are becoming a lot more proactive on who they cover. So you'll get a. Um, a, a, almost a security assessment or a security review ahead of ahead of them um, issuing a policy that goes to underwriting. And so underwriting is looking at your your questionnaire and your assessment responses to say, okay, you know, do they have a mature um, a framework or security framework model in place? You know, you know, are they updating their policies and reviewing and updating their policies on an annual basis? Um, are they doing uh, penetration testing? You know, are they doing vulnerability, regular vulnerability scans? You know, are they doing, um, you know, fish, you know, phishing tests for, for their employees? Because as we know, unfortunately, individuals are your weakest link. Your employees are your weakest link when it comes to, to, to security. Um, but so it's like this circular driver, like, and it, it is improving. Uh, so we're forced to improve because the, the insurance companies are requiring it. 
Um, and as a result, our security postures are improving and we're starting to see, or I should say, you know, incidents are, are may trend down over time because because the insurance companies are requiring these robust uh, 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 practices to be in place. So um, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I, I suspect that it will start to taper off, um, or at least cost wise or level off, I should say. Um, a, a lot of states are passing their own cyber security, not just data privacy laws, but cybersecurity requirements that require any agency, any state agency to have a robust cybersecurity uh, program. But in turn, most states just pass those obligations off to vendors. And so the vendors are now have to have, you know, a robust cybersecurity framework, whether it be something like CM CMMC, which is for uh, to do business with the federal government or FedRAMP. Um, they're, they're, they're putting those requirements in place um, and it's just trickling down through the vendors. You know, if, if, if the larger vendor has it, then the smaller vendor, the medium sized vendor has to have it and then the smaller vendors has to have it. And, and so it, it may improve. I, I do think we are cautiously optimistic in the industry that things will get better um, because they, can't, they almost can't get any worse because it's gotten so bad. So I think we have nowhere to go but up from here. On the topic of vendors, it seems like privacy is getting incredibly complex between like, just for example, on our computers, how many different apps have access to some sort of data. And then some of some of the software development kits and components of those apps are done by third parties that they have some access to some data as well as all the different other vendors that you're using. Can you touch on a little bit kind of how companies are navigating that when it comes to enforcing their own privacy policies as well as uh, complying with different privacy regulations um, and kind of what some of the shortfalls have been yeah, I mean, so great question. And, you know, it requires a bit of thought just to, to, to put it into context, right? So privacy policies have been around pretty much since, you know, websites have been around. You'd always scroll down to the bottom and you see a privacy policy or terms of use. Um, in the past, what you saw were organizations or, or, or platforms or websites that were just copying and pasting a privacy policy from another website. And, and, and you just saw this boilerplate language that, you know, almost had no bearing whatsoever. Recently, I was at a coffee shop and I was logging onto the internet and, um, and I took a look at their privacy policy because they say, hey, you're subject to the terms and conditions of our privacy policy. And I'm a nerd and I read privacy policies. Um, but you can tell that they had hijacked, or I won't say hijacked, but they, you know, they copy and pasted the privacy policy from some other place. Like, you know, why would a coffee shop have to carve out, you know, the, the, the use and sharing of, of, of my data or personal information? Chances are they're probably not doing that. Um, but since they didn't write or tailor the privacy policy directly to, to their practices, it seems like they're, you know, they have an egregious uh, privacy practices. Now that's on a you know on a smaller level of you know dealing with a, 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 a coffee shop so to speak, but for some of the larger platforms, I will say that um, organizations are held accountable by their privacy policy. So if I post a privacy policy on my site, there's not like a privacy police that's going to come and say, hey, you know, in section you know two three of your disclosures or your data sharing, you know, you don't disclose that you have you know this particular sub processor on you know on your list. But what you are seeing is that these organizations are subject to the Federal Trade Commission. So the Federal Trade Commission can enforce a compliance of a privacy policy under uh, the Unfair and Deceptive uh, Trade Practices Act, basically saying that um, if you aren't doing what you say that you're doing in your privacy policy, then you are um, you're, you're doing business unfairly. And and there are the FTC has come down heavy on a lot of organizations who don't do that. It has to be a, a, egregious enough for them to act, because as you can imagine how many different websites and how many different platforms there are out, are out here, they can't govern everybody. But what you'll see is you'll start to get repeated um, uh, violations that are sent over to the Federal Trade Commission. And once they start to see patterns, they'll, they'll act on that. So uh, I'm confident that the organizations that I've had an opportunity to work with absolutely abide by uh, the practices that they put in their privacy policy because they just they have an, a business incentive to do so. Businesses are incredibly risk adverse when it comes to regulation. Um, and, and, and as an attorney, of course, I am as well. And that's what I advise my clients on um, is that you don't want to run afoul of the regulators. 
And so I have not seen any organizations that try to skirt past their responsibilities um, in their privacy policy. Not to say that that doesn't exist. Um, there are tons of data brokers out here. There are tons of uh, organizations that have identified a uh, alternative revenue generating model um, in data uh, to say, hey, you know, we can subsidize our, 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 our income if, if we, you know, participate in this data sharing program and, you know, add, you know, give, give this information to data brokers. Those folks, um, if they're in that position, they likely are flying below the radar or they don't have the resources to be able to comply with a, you know, a robust privacy policy. Or they may or they may say, hey, you know what, we have determined that the money or the income that we're generating off of selling data um, is worth us having a, a, a robust compliance program. And so you'll see, you know, this this this, this use Meta, for example, right? I mean, Meta's whole business model is us uh, collecting and selling personal data. That's it. Uh, they make no bones about it. And so their privacy and security programs um, are tailored around that. And so it kind of varies about per industry. But in short, I think that most organizations uh, who take privacy seriously um, are held accountable by their privacy policies. Yeah, you mentioned the data brokers, because it seems like the company that initially harvests the data, they may have a privacy policy, but after it's exchanged hands multiple times through different data brokers, there's really no oversight or enforcement or really any way to even tell what those data brokers are doing if it. Has that got any, any companies into any sort of legal trouble or some sort of predicament? Um, the, you are correct in that it almost is the wild, wild west when it comes to that. And it has been for quite some time. I do think that that is starting to come to an end. I think with, uh, you, you've seen certain states that are passing regulations that data brokers have to register, uh, within their, their state. Uh, for instance, California, um, is, has required any, any data broker to register, uh, in their state. I think, uh, um, Connecticut does as well. Um, and in Virginia as well. Um, and that kind of puts these data brokers on notice that, hey, we know who you are, you know, we, we are familiar with your organization and we are watching you. And so I, I do think the folks who are specifically in the business of collecting data, I mean, think of, a, of a Equifax, you know, so to speak, they're a data broker. I mean, you know, I mean, on a larger scale, and of course, they've been around for quite some time and it's mostly financial data, but um, the credit reporting agencies are the biggest examples of, of data brokers that gather data, whether it be employment data or where your residence or where you've lived or where you've moved to or, or things like that. Um, they, you know, they are operating above board, of course. Um, but I do think as you see more and more state requirements that the data brokers register within the state, that you will start to see uh, a bit more compliance. Um, and they know, I mean, they're in the business of making money. And so they're going to do whatever they need to do to make sure they're in compliance with the law or else, you know, it will harm their, their revenue model. And it, interestingly enough, I mean, you, you know, when we talk about just how ubiquitous data collection is um, and whether or not we as individual consumers can do anything about it. Honestly, not much. Um, Unfortunately, you know, I myself, I'm a privacy hawk when it comes to my own privacy, just by the, not even because I'm a privacy attorney, but just because I'm a, you know, private person. I just don't want all of my information out there. I mean, um, you know, just to give you an example, I was, I just bought some tickets to the Barrett Jackson uh, auto auction and you had to sign in and give them your personal information just to buy tickets online. And even to get access to the tickets, you had to download the app in order to get the tickets. I mean, it's, it's these sorts of practices that, that uh, for, and, and not to say that, you know, this is representative of all organizations, but in the past, organizations who aren't even data brokers just have a practice of collecting way more information than they need. Uh, and, and they only do it because it's, it's always been done that way. And until they, you know, for, you know, face the long arm of the law or they have some sort of incidents where they learn, you know, the concept of data minimization, is actually beneficial for you in the long run. Um, you know, that data is just, you know, stockpiling somewhere and there's not much we can do about it. Even if you do try to opt out the data collected at the device ID level or, or the advertising ID level, um, is so much, I mean, they get around it by saying that it's anonymized. Um, you know, this unique advertising ID that's associated with each of us, um, technically is anonymized data, but 
it's not. I mean, with a few different data points, you can put it together and string together identification. Uh, but unfortunately, we just don't have the regulation to, uh, to, to govern it. Speaking of, can you talk about a little bit? I know some states have had opt-in laws like California, where basically they have to get your express permission, which I assume a lot of them are probably doing through terms of service that no one's reading. And there's other states, I think like Virginia, and some other ones where they've had opt-out laws, which I mean, that seems incredibly confusing because I don't know how you're supposed to know all the different companies that are collecting data on you. Um, I mean, as we talked about with all the different vendors, SDKs, so it was everything on your phone. Can you talk about some of the differences you've seen between those two laws? Or I guess those two frameworks for laws or general themes? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, in, here in the United States, that has been our default is opt out. Whereas, you know, more conservative uh, privacy regimes like like Europe, like in Europe with the uh, GDPR are, are, are opt in um, and the same with uh, our, 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 our neighbors to the north uh, in, in Canada, uh, which is, in my opinion, it, it should be. Uh, but I, I do think that with the at least I don't know, I, I, I think that that will change eventually, you know, first and foremost, I do think once we see some sort of uh, federal privacy uh, regulation um, that may change to opt in, as you mentioned, there are a couple of states that are that, that are requiring it now. Um, and California is one of them. And California has is usually the driver of a lot of, of federal legislation. Um, one interesting point that I didn't know is that the um, the EPA, like the Environmental Protection Agency, is a result of California passing strict emission testing, you know, back in the 60s and 70s. And as a result, you know, the, on a federal level, they created the you know, um, protection and environment protection laws to match California. And again, I think we'll see the same thing when it comes to data privacy laws on the federal level. I, I think that uh, they will um, they will come in line with what California is doing. Uh, personally, I Anytime I have the option to opt out, I do. Whether or not it makes a difference, I have no idea. Um, but I, I do think that eventually we will start to see that. And, and, and a small example of that is even on um, on the device level or, or at the application level, you see Apple made some changes to um, its its apps where it will rec it will notify you that hey, this app is collecting information on you. Do you wish to continue to share this information? Um, and I, I do think that um, we'll start to see more of that. I think that the days, the wild, wild west days of just massive, massive, massive data point collection are beginning to come to an end. And I do think their organizations know that and they're just going to pivot to another you know, revenue generating model. Um, but at the same time, they have so much data on us already that they really don't need a lot more. I mean, you know. It's, it's funny because, you know, we'll speak, you know, amongst ourselves and say, hey, we were having a conversation about, um, I don't know, skiing or something like that. And all of a sudden I got a, you know, an ad, you know, on my phone for, for, for ski boots or something like that. And we're wondering, like, hey, are they listening to us? But in all actuality, they're not. They have so much data and, and so many refined data points that the, the, the probability of you being a skier is, is really high based upon the amount of information and data points that they have on you. It just seems like they're tracking you um, or listening to you. But but the, the, the detail, the level, the level and the amount of detail for the data points that we're starting, that we're seeing being collected is is just astronomical. And I, I, I don't know where we're going to go from here. I, I do know that with the cost of storage, um, the dramatic drop in the cost of data storage, you've seen the dramatic rise in, in, in information collecting. And they have so, when I say they, I mean just, you know, organizations have so much data on us. It will take years of, um, of analysis and predictive models to, to, to they've, they've got enough data to work for the next decade or so. Um, they don't even have the people yet to be able to sparse through that data. Uh, but we may see we, we, we may see some increases, you know, when it comes to AI and artificial intelligence and predictive uh, analysis and machine learning um, that it will be it will be machines that are kind of, you know, working their way through this data, churning through this data. So even though you know, they may have never collect another data point about you again for the rest of your life, they have enough data on you to 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 have uh, pretty precise and, and pinpoint advertising opportunities. 
So as a consumer going forward, so to speak, uh, what are some things you can do to prevent these companies from getting your data? You know, I, I you know, battle with that every single day, you know, just on my own personal level. Um, the, the thing that you can do is just be cognizant when you're when you're, you know, filling in this information on, on websites and profiles and apps um, to look for these pre ticked boxes that are already checked and, and uncheck them to opt out. Um, if you are signing up for something, you know, do a control F in your browser for it. Just type in opt out to see, you know, if you like if it's a very voluminous, you know, page full of information and they bury the opt out link at the bottom. Um, always, always, always opt out when you get the, you know, the, the, the spam email or the unsolicited emails. Um, I always opt out myself. Um, whether, you know, this is the equivalent of, of me trying to empty the ocean with a, with a thimble, I, I have no idea, but at least it makes me sleep a little better at night knowing that at least my inbox is not just inundated with spam. I'm sure we all have a, you know, a few folks that we know, or we may be one of them, not me, I'm probably too, too anal to do it, but who have, you know, you see folks, they've got like 3000 unread, you know, messages and, you know, most of them are, are from spam because they won't, or they forget to opt out. Or things like when you go to the store, you know, and, and you make a purchase, and they automatically ask you, "What's your email address?" Do you, or do you have a do you have a good email address that, that we can use? People instinctively give that information because they're being asked, and they don't think twice about it. Um, I say, "I don't have an email address," or "No, I don't care to share that email address with you." I, I think folks don't quite understand that they have the option to refuse to give this information. Uh, if they want to, and they should be staunch advocates for themselves when it comes to privacy. Um, a quick example is is re now when you're starting to fly, Homeland Security will ask you to do a face ID in the in the um, in the camera when you are you know going to the uh, security gate, and they don't make it clear that you can opt out of this. Now the Homeland Security states on their website that they are not saving this data, they, they aren't using it, they're not harvesting it, they aren't using your biometric data for anything else. But I don't believe that. We've we've heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. And and so I, I don't even think folks understand that they can opt out of doing that. And anytime I see that, I'm saying, I, you know, I, I, you know, I politely, respectfully, I, I opt out. I, I don't want to be a part of that. And and that's what you have to tell people. Just say, hey, no, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to give you that personal information if it's not necessary. Um, but tendency, we have a tendency in, in the United States to just over collect information um, just because the cost of storage is so cheap. Over the past few years, obviously, there's been some, da some data privacy controversies. I think a long time ago, we were kind of all told told this data collection was for marketing and you know, advertising purposes. And that's slowly kind of eroded. I mean, I give examples of kind of some of the things that happened during COVID. I know the federal government also buys like Department of Homeland Security and FBI. They all buy those location data so they can basically find anyone at any time. But it seems like with all that data being collected, someone could, could basically create like a dossier or really just pick different information and create, you know, basically paint anyone in any, any way they wanted. Have you seen any sort of like, you know, slander lawsuits or defamation lawsuits coming about because of that, or I guess potential ones that could come about because of those? You know, that is a really good point. And no specific lawsuits come to mind, but, you know, I will give you an example. Um, and actually, I think it was John Oliver t tonight did a really great piece on, uh, on data privacy and data points. Um, and he was purchasing in, in his in his, in his uh, show, he was purchasing location data of members of Congress. And so he was able to pinpoint where they were, when they were, you know, when, when they were supposed to be in session, uh, I mean, down to very, very acute uh, level of information. And I, honestly, I think that that may have moved the needle a bit. And I think that, the, you know, after that, we started to see a, a bit more bipartisan support when it came to uh, privacy regulation. But one thing he pointed out, and it's very, very interesting, is that with the amount of data that is available, governments can get around the Fourth, Fourth Amendment uh, search and seizure requirement for, for warrant requirements. So normally for me to get a warrant for where you are, what you're doing, where you've been, who you're with, um, I would need to show a judge probable cause that some, tough or some sort of criminal activity uh, is afoot. For me, for me to get a judge to sign off on that. Now, if I'm a government agency and I want to get that information, I can buy it from Facebook. 
I can literally buy it from your ISP. I can buy it from a data broker. I can buy the information and get around the Fourth Amendment requirement. And I think that will probably be one of the um, the biggest drivers of, 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 of again, I, I do think federal privacy uh, regulation is coming. But I do think that folks weren't aware that the federal, any government, any government, any, not a government agency, anyone can find out anything about you for just by just paying for it. And so, I, you know, we have these constitutional protections in place, you know, for the overreach of the government um, for a reason. And if the government can get by, you know, those protections by just simply, um, you know, acting as a vendor or a consumer, um, then that's a problem. And I, I do think that we will see, we'll see some change on that. And, and again, you'll see the conversation when it comes to data has always been, you know, from consumers like, ah, I don't really do anything. I don't care what they have on me. Like, you know, there's there generally has not been a lot of uh, pushback because folks feel like the data is relatively benign, that they aren't doing anything illegal, that they have nothing to worry about. But if there was ever a mistaking identity or some some sort of um, device device misconfiguration and you have been placed in the wrong place at the wrong time uh, based upon the, the data sharing, I mean, you could, you know, you can get in trouble. And I know that's a big if and it's, you know, kind of, you know, out there, but that possibility does exist. And I, I think that is one of the, you know, again, one of the biggest drivers for the need for federal privacy regulation is to be able to keep uh, governmental agencies in check because they are constitutionally bound, you know, to, to, to abide by uh, privacy rights and things like that. But this is a workaround and it is a problem. So as we start to get to the end here, I think one thing we've asked a lot, I know we, we talked about, Eric and I, we talked with Tim, uh, Tim Romer, and his opinions on TikTok. What's your opinion on TikTok? It seems, you know, like you're sending a lot of your information to a country that is not always very friendly to the U.S. and doesn't have the same values as we do. What's your opinion on it? You know, <laughs> I, 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 I can just say that I'm not a personal user of TikTok. You know, I refuse to use it. I refuse to download it um, on my phone. But, that you know, that's to say I don't download a lot of apps, you know, for, for that reason. Um, but I have, I can't say that I've personally seen or I've personally read their, their privacy policy or privacy practices. I'm not aware of it, but the conversations in the privacy circles has been that the information collection is so, so, so pervasive that it is so widespread and the scope of it is so large that Yes, that poses a significant national security risk for a, a country. And, you know, let's you know, be honest that the owners of TikTok um, are still owned by 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 the government uh, in China um, to have access to that level of detailed information on a wide, wide, wide variety of Americans. And, and we just talked about how how the data points can be so accurate and defined and, and defined that it may seem like someone is spying on you. Uh, but just imagine that, you know, uh, an adverse organization or an adverse entity or nation state having very, 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 very detailed level of information on a large majority of your citizens. The possibilities are, 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 are infinite. I mean, you know, I'm not a doomsday person. I'm not a, you know, conspir conspiratorialist or anything like that, but I am a, a realist and I do know that what can happen with the potentiality of, of, of having um, this this very acute level of, of data points, um, what can happen? I mean, you know, how that may play out in the long run, I'm not sure. Uh, but you have started to see uh, state and local level governments banning the use of TikTok on, on their devices. Uh, I think that's a, absolutely a good move. Um, I would caution anyone who's using it to Make sure you take a look at the uh, privacy settings in there. Uh, don't just use them by default. Um, you know, take a look at them. Stop sharing the data. You know, if 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 you can, um, I, I certainly would allow, wouldn't allow my children to use uh, a TikTok. You know, if I had children that were under the, under the age of eighteen, um, I, it, I I just you know f for a whole host of reasons that you know I, I'm not a huge fan of it. Uh, the number one reason being the pervasiveness of the information that's being collected. So oftentimes, just to give you a, a brief example, um, 
you know, my, I have adult sons. I have twin 23 year old boys and they'll send me, um, you know, a funny TikTok video or hey, some of the stuff is informative. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not like the stuff doesn't have, you know, any type of innate value. Um, but just sharing the video from what I'm from, for what I'm understanding is there is, you know, code embedded in the videos themselves that can tell you, you tell the host information about who received it, whether or not they have TikTok installed on their device or not. I mean, to me, that is just astronomical amount of uh, or, or invasiveness that I wouldn't want to be a part of. Yeah, yeah, that makes it makes a lot of sense. It seems like on the other hand, too, I've heard the argument the other way that, yes, they're collecting a lot of information, but there's a million other places China could just go buy that information. Like you mentioned, you could buy it from Facebook or someone else. But before we before we end it, if people want to follow you for more insights, uh, this has been incredibly insightful. If people want to follow you for more insights, where is the best place to follow you? Um, LinkedIn. Um, I'm, you know, relatively, you know, searchable on LinkedIn. It's just Ryan Ryan Johnson ESQ uh, ESQ. Yeah, it'll, it'll come right up. Uh, other than that, I try not to use um, social media. It's, even though social media is is a great thing, it can be a great tool. Um, you know, as far as you know, exposure and getting the word out. Again, I'm still a private person. I'm, by default, I'm a, I'm a privacy guy. And so I, I try to keep a relatively small online footprint, whether or not that's helpful in the end for my own, you know, business, you know, business, you know, adventures or whatnot. But um, LinkedIn is just primarily the place that I am uh, when it comes to, to, to sharing information. I, I try to share as much information as I possibly can with the folks that I'm connected with. And in turn, I, I and connected with an incredibly large swath of privacy and security individuals. And, and, and that's from the number one place that I turn to uh, to get updates on uh, what's happening, uh, whether it be from different organizations or different countries or different reg, you know, reg, uh, pieces of regulation. Um, but I would invite, advise you, you know, your audience members to, and it sounds like if, if folks are tuning into this show that they're, they're already two steps ahead of the game and, and they know um, the, um, you know, what's the stake when it comes to personal security as well as uh, entity or, or organizational security as well. So, um, yeah, LinkedIn is about it for me. All right. Awesome. Hey, well, thanks so much for coming on. Absolutely. Anytime. Uh, I am uh, extraordinarily uh, grateful that you guys um, for taking the time to speak with me and, and sharing this message uh, when it comes to privacy and security. It's important for all of us. And so I really appreciate what you guys are doing.